Joshua tonight, um, chapter 2. If you guys would turn there. I want to give just a little recap of kind of what's been going on. Um, we did go, Pastor Jason ended on Leviticus and we skipped over Numbers and Deuteronomy and came to Joshua. And Isaiah spoke last week about basically Joshua kind of coming into the place of Moses. But where we're at right now is we're about at like 1400 BC. Um, the Israelites at this point are camped east of the Jordan River. Um, their whole encampment's over there. They've already taken some possession of the land. Um, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh actually are already kind of taken over over there. And they're still there, right about to enter into the promised land and inherit what God gave them. And at this point, Moses died and Joshua succeeded him. And Isaiah did a good job last week sharing about, you know, Moses is gone now, Joshua's rising up. He's the new leader of the Israelites in the sense, following God as his leader in a sense. But let's begin with the reading. Actually, let's pray and then we'll get going. God, we thank you for tonight. I feel so honored to be able to be up here and just read your word and just touch on some of the points, God. And I just pray tonight that you just speak to all of our hearts through your word, Lord, and anything else that you put on my heart to share that might encourage someone. I ask that that just go into their hearts and just be a seed that'll be sown and on good soil and that would just bring fruit into their lives and into my life. So bless tonight, bless all of us here in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So chapter two, verse one. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. And I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and to Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. And spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So the man said to her, our life for yours if you do not tell this business of ours and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So in the beginning of this chapter, we see that Joshua sends out two spies to go get intel on the land basically and he specifies one place, Jericho. It's kind of interesting because Joshua used to be a spy in and of himself. I don't know if you guys remember the passage, it's in Numbers where Moses sends out 12 spies. They all come back, say, yeah, the land is full of milk and honey, but like 10 of them are all like, there's giants there and like they're all scared and timid and then Joshua and Caleb are the two guys who are like, no, God's given it to us, let's go take it. So it's kind of an interesting little thing right here. It's like, you know, they sent out 12 before and only two came out, came back saying, let's go for it. So it seems like Joshua's kind of like, let's just send two good guys out and we'll avoid this whole like getting all this different information. Um, but the first city that they're gonna be coming to, Jericho, is the first city that when the Israelites do cross over the Jordan is the first city they come against and that they attack. And this city of Jericho is one of the oldest cities in the world and it was considered unconquerable at the time because it had this huge wall all around it. And even recent archeological digs in it say that there was actually like a second wall in, like in between. So you got this 
just think of this big city with this big wall around it. I kind of think of like, I don't know if you guys seen that movie Troy or know of the Trojan stuff, but it's like the big wall and it's like, how do we get in here? And they build their, that big horse and bring it in or whatever. But these guys got God, so they don't need a horse. So um, we see that they were sent from Shittim. So this is what I was saying earlier is a little east of the Jordan. It's all kind of on the same latitude line. So basically you have Shittim right here, the river right there, and then Jericho, it's all kind of like right together. And so when they come to Jericho though, these two spies, they arrive and they go into the house of a prostitute named Rahab. And my question in the beginning is, how did they end up here? It's like out of all the places in Jericho, you end up at this prostitute's house. Um, So here are the options. Um, First one could be to use the services. I'm not promoting that, but that is an option. Um, Two, it wouldn't raise much suspicion because at a prostitute's house, a lot of people coming in and out and everything like that. Easy for two spies to kind of sneak in and, you know, hide in the sea of faces. Could have been the only place that was available for, you know, lodging. You know, you got to take what you can get. And the final one is, it was a, and which is what I kind of lean towards, is more of a strategic choice, which we will get to later on in the, in the chapter. But either way, it was God ordained because we're going to see the redemption, like for Rahab and what's all gonna go on. So either way, God was leading these spies to do this. So they stay here. At this point, the king of Jericho hears the news that two spies have come into the land. I guess he heard it from the wine vine, but, or Instagram, I don't know if they had it at the time. But, so the king commands Rahab, he, he comes down, I'm not sure if it's himself, or he orders soldiers to go down there, and he says, bring out these spies to us. And at this point, Rahab had hidden the spies, either hearing of this and knowing it, so hides them, and then she admits to the king that the spies did come, but she plays unaware of their origin, whether she knew about that or not, that's up to speculation. But then at this point in verse five, um, she lies and she says that the men departed right as the gates of the city were closing, which was at night to kind of protect them. And she continues kind of in this lie saying that she doesn't know where the spies went, But at this point, I think she does something very clever where like she kind of puts a sense of urgency. It says like, hurry, pursue them quickly. Like almost like don't waste time trying to look in my house and trying to see where they're at. It's like, get up, go. If you leave now, you can get them. And it's like, it's kind of like, well, yeah, we're out of here. Open the gates, you know, like, so I think she's very smart in this. But this also brings up the question, is lying okay? We know in the Ten Commandments it says you shall not bear false witness. Proverbs 12.22 says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But in this circumstance, we see Rahab lying to protect people. And we see another example of this. If you guys remember in Egypt, while the Israelites were still there, the midwives also lied to protect the babies because they wanted them to kill the, the children. And the midwives lie and say like, oh, like they already did it. But in this sense, the midwives, it even says of them in Exodus that they feared the Lord. That's why they did this. And even with Rahab in this sense, it's like she's choosing, hey, if I lie to these guys, I'm putting my life at risk. Because if she's lying to the king and saying, these spies, saying I didn't know these spies came in, she's wrestling with treason right here. So if they find out that the spies are there, she'd probably be put to death along with these spies, whether they'd be tortured or something. So now she's risking her life for the lives of these Israelites. And I feel a more modern, even though it's kind of still a little old for a lot of us here, is like World War II, you know, like a lot of people hid the Jews from the Nazis and they would lie and say, we don't have them here. And you basically, it's kind of like it comes to this thing where you're choosing the lesser of two evils. Because like even with this thing with World War II, it's like, okay, I ha- I'm hiding Jews. If I tell these Nazis, yes, they're here, I'm being honest, but now I'm allowing them to come murder these Jews or bring them to a concentration camp, which is just as bad, or like way gnarlier in a sense. Or I can lie, which is kind of a less, like whatever. Compared to murder, I think lying and murder, you know, I hope we can balance that out, that murder is a lot worse than lying. The point is, lying is not okay. But I think we see grace here when these circumstances, when it comes to, I'm trying to protect and be in line with what God's doing. And obviously in this circumstance, it was God's people, God sent these spies in there, God was giving them the land, and Rahab was getting on board with what God was doing. 
So Rahab had hidden the spies and stalks of flax on her roof, and flax are, are like a plant fiber, and at this time they used it for clothing. Um, and it was very normal for them to go on the roof and kind of put the cloth up there because they'd use the sun to kind of dry it out. So Rahab, having this set up, hiding the spies under there, I'd say she was a very clever girl. But yeah, so the men of Jericho began pursuing the spies towards Jordan. So at this point, they head east. I think that's from your guys' way. And they go towards the Jordan, and they come to the crossing points. And after, after the spies, or after the soldiers and stuff leave going towards the Jordan, the gates are closed because either one, it was dark out, so they kept it closed, or just in case if they were still in there, it was to keep them from trying to leave. So before the spies go to lay down, though, it says to go sleep, Rahab comes up on the roof and where she's hidden them, and she says to them, she knows that the Lord has given the Israelites the promised land, and she declares to them that it's like the fear of God and the Israelites has spread to Jericho and all the Canaanites, and it's like this fear, and it says, here, I like the word, it's like they're melting, it's like this fear of what God is doing is just crazy among all the Canaanites. And she shares in verse 10 about how they heard about what God did at the Red Sea. And this is crazy to think because even at this point, it's like they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So the, this Red, Red Sea thing about them going through is already over 40 years old, but they still are aware of it. Even the Can- It's like they heard somehow that God split the Red Sea, brought all the Israelites through it, drowned the Egyptians, and they're hearing of this. And it's like they are, their hearts are melting because of this. And she even goes into how they defeated the two kings east of the Jordan, which was the uh, Sihon and Og. And that part's in Numbers 21, but for sake of time, I don't want to go into the whole thing, but I'll give you guys a little spark notes. But these, yeah, these two kings were east of the Jordan. And what happened was Israel was trying to go through their land so that they could come into the promised land. So at that time, Moses was asked King Sihon, he's like, can we pass through your land? We won't eat of your grape. We won't go wherever. We'll just go through and we'll leave your land alone. Just let us go through. And so King Sihon says, no. And then he's like, now I'm going to war against you guys because I don't like you. And obviously God's on their side. So Israel strikes down King Sihon. And then after that, King Og wants to go to war with them now. I guess he didn't learn, hey, God just delivered these guys. And he's like, I'm going to try now too. Maybe I'll get an upper hand on them. So they slay him too. So basically they're hearing about how God is working with the Israelites, how if God's with them, nobody can stand against them and he's just smoking guys who are getting in the way. So there's this fear among the Canaanites that this God is, he's the God of the heavens. He's the God of earth. In verse 11, it says, when the people heard of what happened basically with these kings and with the Red Sea, it's like their hearts melt. There was no spirit left in them. It's like, it's kind of just like, we're already defeated and it's just this kind of like sad state. And this is all because, and Rahab says this, is because the Lord is with them and he is the God in the heavens and the earth. So Rahab asked the spies at this point to swear to her that they will act kindly to her in her father's house since she was kind to them. And at this point, the spies swear to her that they will and they make an oath with her as long as she doesn't leak any information about them being there and that when God gives them the land, when God gives them Jericho and delivers, he, they will deal kindly with her and they will fulfill the oath that they made. So let's read now at verse 15 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Then Rahab, she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, go to the hill country, lest the pursuers happen upon you and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward, you may go on your way. And the men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourself into the house, your father and mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, when we shall be free from the oath which you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And they departed and came to the hill country and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned now, or re- until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road but had not found them. 
Then the two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they related to him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and all the inhabitants of the land, moreover, have melted away before us. So beginning at verse 15, we see Rahab lets the spies down on, by a rope through her window. And this kind of goes back to the reasoning of the spies coming here. This is that strategic part. The fact that she lived on the wall made it so that they were able to escape by this rope out of the wall, which leads to my reasoning more of why I think it was more of a strategic thing. Yet again, God's leading in all this. He's the master sovereign over this. Rahab advises the spies to go into the hills so the pursuers will not find them. And it seems like Rahab has some intel on this, either on how they kind of routinely go, do their searches or do whatever. But she gives them yet again, she's got some wisdom in the sense and she's smart to hide there for three days in these hills which were a little west of Jericho until they come and then, then to leave. And at this point, the spies tell Rahab to tie a scarlet cord to the window uh, that she, the window that she let them down from and gather her house into it. And she, they tell her that if she doesn't do this, they will be blameless if they get destroyed during this conquest. The spies say that if anyone leaves her house while they are invading, then their blood will be on their own heads. But if anyone is harmed in Rahab's house with the scarlet cord, as long as she keeps her oath to them, that they will be safe. And then the spies reiterate that if she doesn't keep her word, yet again, she, they will be released from the oath. So what we see here is some terms and conditions that kind of get put in. Um, I don't know if you guys are well aware of contracts. I'm sure you guys have dealt with it, but we got three things here. Rahab has to keep silent. Second is she got to tie the scarlet cord up. And the third thing is they all got to stay in the house during this time. It's kind of cool here because they see the spies kind of act as ambassadors of not only the Israelites but of God in a sense because we're going to see in the coming chapters that God wants to wipe out this whole city but because these men make an oath with this woman that she is safe from this and God honors that and even Joshua as the le leader of the Israelites also honors that too. And at this point, you know, she sent the spies away and she instantly ties up this scarlet cord, at least what the scripture kind of implies here. And this scarlet cord is the big, I feel, gospel part of this whole message, which we kind of talk about how the gospel is kind of throughout the whole scripture. This scarlet cord is going to be the thing that they can identify Rahab's house by and be able to be like, hey, don't touch this house. This is, what the, spy, this is the lady's house that the spies were talking about. And then this kind of goes back to, first of all, the Passover. As we saw that in Exodus where it's like God was going to come and smite the firstborn child of every family but if they had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, the angel would pass over and no one would be destroyed in that house. And we also see this with the gospel of Jesus Christ that he is our Passover lamb. He is our scarlet cord. He is the one that his blood is over our doorpost. And if we believe in him and we abide in him, we will be able to get, we won't suffer destruction. We won't be punished for our sin. And, and for us as pre-tribbers, we believe we'll be free from the wrath that's to come in the tribulation. The thing I really like about this though, and I'm gonna emphasize in this, is Rahab ties this rope instantly. She doesn't wait for the invasion. She doesn't wait like, oh, I see the Israelites out there. Oh, get this rope up real quick and get everybody in the house. It says she ties it up. And I really like that because I feel that's for today. I think there's a lot of people, and I've heard in my personal life, it's like, yeah, you know what? Like, you guys say the rapture's coming. You guys say all this stuff, the tribulation's coming. I'll believe it when I see it. It's like, don't wait. Like, you don't know. It's like, first of all, we don't know how long we're going to live. We can go at any moment. And the point is, is are we willing to risk that or do we want to tie this scarlet cord up now? And, you know, the metaphor, it's like, do we want to accept Jesus now and be able to just be free from all this stuff? Yeah, I just, I really think... If, if you're here tonight, I, I know a lot of people here are believers and already believe, so I'm probably preaching to the choir. But if you aren't, I encourage you guys, don't wait. Believe now. Don't, don't even risk it. It's like Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to go through the tribulation. He wants to be with you. So don't wait. Believe now. We see in verse 22 that the spies hid in the hills for the three days. They obeyed what Rahab suggested. 
And at this point, the pursuers return to the city after they have not found the spies after the three days. At this point, I kind of have this vision. It's like I can just see the king being upset and fear just increasing in Jericho. It's like we're looking for these spies. We haven't found them. And their hearts have already melted from all the things they've already heard. And it's like we haven't found them. They've got an intel of our land. They've made it back. It's like I can just see this chaos all going on right now. And we see in verse 20 through this 23, that the spies return to Joshua and tell him everything that happened. And then in verse 24, the spies tell Joshua that it's obvious that God has given all the land to the Israelites because the people in the land are in fear of God and the Israelites. So with that being said and that being done, the scripture, I do have some points, I guess, to make some practical things and to talk about right now. Um, one thing I want to point out is we see that the whole city of Jericho was afraid and fearful of God. It says their hearts melted. But we see a difference with Rahab is she feared, but she believed. She had faith in God and she wanted to be on the right side, the right, the winning team here. She wasn't like everybody else who was in fear, trying to do whatever they can to protect themselves. She was realizing, hey, I want to be on the winning team here. And it's obviously this God because he is the God of the heavens. He is the God of earth. For today, it's, guys, destruction is coming just as much for these people in Jericho. It was coming for them. It's coming for this earth. It's coming for non-believers. And my question is, whose side are you on? And it goes back. It's like, if, if we're in Jesus, we're on the right side. We're safe from it. And the question is, do you have the scarlet rope put up? Do you have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost? Or are you here tonight playing Russian roulette with it? trying to be like, we'll see. Don't wait. And if you do believe in Jesus, I just want to encourage you guys, even with all the chaos going in the world, have peace. That we don't have to worry about destruction. We don't have to worry about the tribulation. We don't have to worry. Even It's like the thing we got to worry about is death here, but even if we die, it's like we go to heaven. It's like we don't have to worry about the destruction because God will redeem us in whatever way that looks. We know we will be with him in heaven. I love the grace and mercy of God um, it allow, that allowed Rahab to be saved when the whole city was meant for destruction. And, you know, it's, it's the same grace and mercy that we have. You know, we all are, we're dead in our sins. We all deserved hell. And God loved us so much. He came and died for us and provided a way for us. And just as much as we look at this girl, Rahab, who was a prostitute, and you can go in any way, it's like, God's given this girl grace because she believed in God. That is the same grace that you and I have today. I love Rahab's heart that she desires to save her family. It says, my father, my sisters, my brothers. And I want to encourage you guys and myself tonight. We need to have the same heart, guys. And not just our blood family, but for the people around us, it's like destruction is coming. And we need to do whatever we can to share the love of Christ with them so that people on this earth will not suffer that punishment. Just as I mentioned earlier, the spies acted as ambassadors for Israel and for God in a sense. You guys, so do we. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about the ministry of reconciliation and that we are ambassadors of that, guys. We are ambassadors of, ambassadors of God's grace to people and we are coming, giving that ministry of reconciliation where it's like, hey guys, Jesus loves you, you've sinned against him, we, through repentance and believing you can be saved and we are here as those ambassadors to lead people to that grace so that they can be saved. You know, I was thinking too, like after looking at this whole mission of like the spies going out and, you know, the spies to go check out the land and see Jericho, you know, honestly, it wasn't really to exploit any weakness in Jericho because we know what happens. It's like, I'm sure you guys all know, sorry to, spoiler alert, it's they march around and the walls come down. So it wasn't like, go look for some weakness in their wall so we can open it up and we can come in. It wasn't for that at all. What I see here is two things is one, to gain confidence. It's like, hey, look, guys, like these people are in fear of God. You guys can go in here with boldness knowing that. It's like these guys are afraid of Jehovah God. And the second thing as we see, the other reason for this is to save Rahab and her family. It's like God knew this woman believed in him and so he sent these two spies to help save her. The sovereignty of God. 
The final thing to kind of look at, I'm sure you guys probably knew this was common, is um, just where Rahab is kind of reflected in the New Testament. Um, the first thing is Matthew 1. She's recorded in Jesus' genealogy. She's ended up being his ancestor. And it's a beautiful redemption story that this prostitute who was a Canaanite is listed as Jesus' great, 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 whatever, to whatever extent, grandmother. That's the grace of God. The second thing is she's mentioned in James chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. It says, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works, also when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So we see Rahab as an example of faith by works. Yet again, all these people in Jericho feared God, but Rahab feared God and believed and put it into action, which was taking these two spies in and leading them safely out. And the final thing we see with her is she's in the hall of faith, which you Bible scholars know as Hebrews 11. Is, it says, Hebrews 11.31 says, By faith the prostitute Rahab did not perish along with those who were disobedient, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. So this woman, through her faith, gets recorded in the hall of faith. And I just want to let you guys know, it's like wherever you're at, you guys, even if you are walking with the Lord and maybe in something, it's like you guys can repent and turn to God. And just as much as Rahab did that and turned to God, her name was written in the hall of faith. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life when we turn to him. So that's it for tonight. Let's pray and yeah, we'll be on our way. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are our Passover, you are our scarlet cord, you are our Savior, Lord. We thank you that you have forgiven us, God, that we have all been dead in our sins, Lord, but you have redeemed us, you've given us life, and that you even use us, God. We're not worthy of it at all, but we're so grateful, Lord, that you even do that. We love you so much for that. We love you for your grace. We love you for your mercy. We thank you that you've given us a way to be with you, Lord, and to escape and not perish, Lord. Just like John 3.16 says, we believe in you, Lord, we have eternal life, and we get to escape the destruction of hell. We love you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. I ask God for all of us here that you give us a desire to just want to reach out to our brothers and sisters, your lost sons and daughters, that we would just bring them to you, Lord, and act as ambassadors on your behalf, trying to bring that ministry of reconciliation, Lord. Get us all home safe tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.